may I consider with you the largest commandment in the Decalogue, the first positive one, the most particularistic commandment, and it begins with the word remember, and it is the command that almost all the world has forgotten. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labour and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, etc. The condition of nature, the constitution of things, is all about labour and rest. That's why God invented the night, so we couldn't labour all the time. But each night is not sufficient. God gives us 52 spring days in the year, 52 stepping stones to heaven, 52 reflections of paradise, the day he blessed at creation. It's the first religious institution in the Bible. So the Sabbath of the fourth commandment is not only a rest day, but it's a blessed day, and it's the best day, but it's also a test day. The only people who will bother about the fourth commandment are those that are really concerned with doing the full will of God. A test commandment? Yes. At the beginning and end of each dispensation, the tests of God's people is how they worship. There are three dispensations, as you know, the patriarchal, the times from Adam down to Moses, the Levitical dispensation, all through the Old Testament after the coming out of Egypt, and the Christian. But at the beginning and end of each dispensation, there's a test over worship, a test that involves the fourth commandment. Would you notice that the reason given for the fourth commandment is from six days God made heaven and earth, on the seventh day he rested, and he blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Here using the symbols of the opening verses of the Bible in words that we can understand, because God doesn't get tired. Exodus in one place says God rested on the Sabbath and was refreshed. Of course, that is human language, how God fainteth not, neither is weary. But he is pictured as a worker and a rester, and the constitution of nature demands that we be the same. I'm not talking about something small, something tiny. I'm talking about 10 years of your life, if you live to 70 years of age. You'll spend 10 years if you obey the fourth commandment in worship of God. So in the patriarchal age, the first time the Sabbath is named after creation is Exodus 16, where the Lord says, I'll test you whether you'll keep my law or not. And he tested them in connection with the fourth commandment and the manna. When we come to the end of the patriarchal age and begin the Levitical age, God speaks the fourth commandment as the people gather in holy awe around the shaking mountain. And God says, remember, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. For the Lord God has blessed it and sanctified it. By sanctified, it means set it apart. It's special. It's not meant to be a day of gloom. Everything good can be perverted. But the Sabbath is called in the Bible a delight, the holy of the Lord, honourable. It's a day in which we can enjoy nature, enjoy worship of God, enjoy serving in a way it may be difficult to serve on other days. It's a very special time, this stepping stone to heaven. The Old Testament and the New, 165 times, refer to the fourth commandment 165 times. 
you know, many people think the Colossians 2, 16 outlaws the law, but that could not be. Colossians 2, 16 warns us against what scholars call a pre-Gnostic heresy when people worshipped angels at holy times and abstained from food and drink. If you want to have wipe out all Sabbath keeping by the one verse that seems to be against it, you must also wipe out all eating and drinking, which are mentioned in the same context. Also, the context talks about after the traditions of men. So this is not talking about the commandments of God. You cannot rescind a commandment except with the same glory and honour and magnificence that it is enunciated. And the letter of Paul couldn't have done that. But that's the only verse in the Bible that seems to speak negatively about the day God blessed and sanctified, made honourable and called a delight. But 165 times it is positive. Let me read to you from the scriptures some things God has said. And I suggest that most people do not even know what I'm about to read. Even when they hear it, they've probably never heard it. And yet what I'm about to read to you is very important. Listen to this. Thus says the Lord, Keep ye judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come, and my righteousness about to be revealed. Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the Son of Man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. It's suggesting if we remember the fourth commandment, we'll also remember the other nine. Neither let the son of the stranger, the Gentile, who's joined himself to the Lord, saying the Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, I'm a dry tree. Thus says the Lord, unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbath, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in mine house, within my walls, a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I'll give them an everlasting name. This shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the stranger, the Gentile, that join themselves to the Lord, to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants. Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it takes hold of my covenant. Even them I'll bring to my holy mountain. Here's a promise of heaven for those who surrender to the love of God and bring forth the fruit of obedience. I'll make them joyful, my host of house of prayer. The Lord God that gathers the outcasts of Israel makes these promises. And that's Isaiah 56. Now listen to Isaiah 58. This too is unknown to most Christians, and yet it's very important. Beginning at verse 13. If if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honourable, shall honour him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. I'll cause thee to ride on the high places of the earth, Feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So here scripture speaks about the Sabbath as a delight, the holy of the Lord, honourable, but it's his, a time to think of holy things, a time to serve in a way we cannot serve during the week. What was Christ's attitude? There are seven controversial passages in the New Testament where Christ rebukes the legalism of the Jews about the Sabbath. He said the Sabbath was made for man. In other words, made at the same time, at the beginning, when all things were made, but like everything else, made for man, for his blessing, for his help. The Sabbath was made for man. You know, the first time you read about the Jews wanting to kill Jesus was over the Sabbath. And so the fourth commandment, 
humanly speaking, is the reason Jesus went the cross. Of course, mainly, he went there to take my sins and to take yours. But they hated him because he, he turned the holy day into a delight and made it honourable. The first time it's mentioned in the New Testament is Matthew 12, and it's preceded by these words at the end of chapter 11. Come unto me, all ye who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me. I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. This is the real meaning of the Sabbath. The rest we have in Christ, because we trust in his finished work. People who push the fourth commandment often push it legalistically. It's meant to be an image of the gospel. That makes it blessed indeed. In Matthew 24, I think it's verse 20, he warned the Jews that when they fled, the Jewish Christians, before the destruction of Jerusalem, it would kill a million Jews and 100,000 would be taken captive. He said, pray your flight from the city, not be on the Sabbath day. Why did he say that? Here is a book by Dr. James Morrison, one of the best commentaries ever written on the book of Matthew. What does he say about this verse in Matthew 24? Listen, this is what the commentator says. Jesus was not anticipating a new state of things in which there'd be no sabbatical day whatever. By no means. It would be very far from desirable in the present condition of human nature that our weeks should be without their special day of solemn pause. It would be an uninterruptedly, especially amid the competitive forces and consequent fastness of commercial and highly civilised communities. It would be spiritually and morally and even physically disastrous if amid the continual stretching and straining and bending toward earth and earth's things, there were no periodical parentheses or seasons frequently recurring during which the worldly bow could be unbent and men could be turned systematically upward and heavenly, uh, heavenward. The rest of the Decalogue holds good for all dispensations. Why not this? That says, like Bishop Ryle, like Spurgeon, like most of the great Christians of the ages, they honoured God and honoured his day. Do you, my friend, do you accept this symbol of the rest in Christ? Read Hebrews 4, verse 9. It remains the Sabbath, the people of God. It means the Sabbath of the heart and the mind. We who believe to enter into rest. I pray God. You'll enter that rest today. God bless you.